Good morning. morning. You know what? I am looking forward to the sermon this morning for the third time. Seriously. uh, That was what I was going to put in the announcements at the end of the last service, and I forgot. That I was looking forward to hearing it again. After our worship today, we don't have another service that you can hear the sermon a second time. But you can go online, because we're going to be live streaming. And so it'll, it'll be there on our Facebook. Because I keep needing to hear this. I mean, it's about me in at least two ways. The, the, the complaining people of Israel, and then Moses and his complaining about these people who are, who are complaining. You, you were my intended audience oh, for the man. sermon. <laughs> it was an out-of-body experience. Of, yeah, the... And... And where is the delight, where is the, where is this refreshment or joy that has, that God has for us? And it's in community. So I'm so glad you're together with us. And those who are joining us online, we are very glad that you are here with us also. And we pray that you will be refreshed by God's word today. So let's begin our worship with our opening hymn, Forgive Our Sins as we forgive us number 843 you stand as we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord for peace from God and peace among our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord for peace among all who seek to serve Christ and support his church. Let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who gather here to be strengthened in faith and encouraged in service, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. The Apostle James, rather, James, the brother of our Lord, writes, Be patient until the coming of the Lord. Do not grumble against one another. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone among you sick? Pray over him. Even though we may consider ourselves cheerful and enjoy singing praises to God, truly we still need him to deal with us in mercy. Daily, we fail to follow his directives for Christian living. The Apostle James reminds us and urges us Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Let us all, therefore, lay our sins on Jesus, looking to him for forgiveness. Boy. 
Almighty God, we confess our impatience, our lack of care for our brothers and sisters in Christ, and our words that do not always reflect the love you have for us. Amen. God has cured our sickness of sin by sending his son Jesus to die in our place. He values us deeply and calms our fears, saying, have salt in yourselves, be at peace with one another. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you for all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. We sing Psalm 103, the words of hymn 814. Everlasting Father, source of every blessing, mercifully direct and govern us by your Holy Spirit that we may complete the works you have prepared for us to do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we hear the word of God. The Old Testament reading is taken from the book of Numbers, chapter 11. The people complained to Moses in the wilderness. Now the rabble that was among the people had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept again.
Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give all this people? For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered seventy men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets that the Lord would put his spirit on them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is taken from the book of James, chapter 5, a prayer of faith. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and bore, the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord.
Would you stand as we hear the gospel, the good news about our Savior Jesus Christ? The gospel is recorded for us by St. Mark in his ninth chapter. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. and We tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess together the faith that we share with one another and with all believers in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll sing our sermon hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, number 649. Before I start the message today, I just want to say to Pastor Nundorf, I look forward to the day 
when I can hype one of your sermons before a service so that everyone has unreasonable expectations. <laughs> She's always alone. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Next week, we start our sermon series on the book, Delight. And I invite you, I urge you to grab one on your way out and, uh, and also to sign up to be part of a conversation group, whether it's uh, a group where you'll meet with a, a few different people or just one other person to have in your life to start talking uh, about the things we read, the things that you enjoy, the way that God is um, reminding you of his promises. There are discussion questions at the, uh, at the end of each chapter. And I invite you to take those dis dis discussion questions and use those in your conversations in your Bible studies that you're already doing, in your coffee meetups, at your lunch breaks, on your school commutes, at your tailgates, wherever you find yourself, practice intentionality in refocusing how you look at your every day. I highlight this because I want to offer sort of a, a week zero for this sermon series, and this is without receiving full approval from the author. Uh, so my apologies to Pastor Rosso, uh, but when I looked at the Old Testament and the epistle lessons for today, for this weekend, I, I think they present a slice of the picture that gets us from where we are now to the delight that God delivers. So where are we right now? In a bunch of conversations that I've had over the past few weeks, I've realized that most of us, many of us, have similar feelings about the world around us. This is through hospital visits and phone calls and personal conversations and meetings, uh, discussions with people whose kids are having to, to quarantine. They've said, and I've said it too, I'm just so sick of all of this. We're sick of the need of quarantines and testing. We're sick of the social anxiety and the weighing of the optics that we have personally and, and uh, corporately. We're sick of the feelings we get when we arrive somewhere and we say, oh, I forgot my mask. We're tired of all of it. And we even cringe, we really cringe, when someone suggests, well, you know, maybe some of this is the new normal in our life today. Because that can't be right. Things have to get back to the way that they were when we didn't have to worry about what the definition was of a close contact with someone, when we could make travel plans without having to put also the word maybe on our calendar, when we didn't have months of shipping delays and toilet paper rations again at Costco. I was comfortable with the way that things were. And the way that things now are not like it used to be, and I'm just so sick of this right now. And that's a far cry from delight. The Old Testament reading from Numbers 11 gives us a picture of the I'm just so sick of this right now idea, but it, it's helpful also to understand where Israel is in, this, in their timeline as we read Numbers 11. So to give a, a quick recap, the, the nation of Israel, God's people, had been called by Abraham and his descendants to, to live in the land that he was giving to them, and Jacob and his family at the time of famine moved to Egypt, 70 people. And as they lived in Egypt, they got along well until a pharaoh started enslaving them and their people, and they grew over 400 years to this great nation, 600,000 men plus women and children. And they cried out to God to deliver them, and God said, I will send you one, Moses, who's going to help deliver you. And so God sent Moses and Aaron to speak to Pharaoh to deliver the people. And Pharaoh said no. And so God sent ten plagues. And eventually Pharaoh said leave. And so they left and they got to the Red Sea. And Pharaoh's army pursued them again. And God delivered them miraculously by parting the sea as Israel crossed to safety. And 
Pharaoh's army was consumed by the Red Sea. And Israel traveled then to Mount Sinai, and God reestablished his covenant and his will and his promises for his people, reminding them that he is the God who delivered them from slavery in Egypt, and he would bring them into the good land that he was leading them to. And this happens over the course of the second half of the book of Exodus, at the time at Mount Sinai. It's the second half of the book of Exodus, the entire book of Leviticus, and the first nine to ten chapters of the book of Numbers are spent at Mount Sinai, about 13 months. And so finally, now that God has reestablished this covenant with them and prepared them to go, he sends them out, he leads them out, northeast of Mount Sinai as they travel toward the Promised Land. And after three days of journeying, we get Numbers chapter 11. And in Numbers 11, we read, Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving, and the people also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt. That's how you read it. No, I bet it was way worse than that. Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses has heard the people weak, being throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Three days. That's all it took for this caravan to shout out, we're so sick of this. We remember when we had fresh fish, fruits, and vegetables. We remember what life was like in the past. You can get a sense of this if you've ever been on a road trip with a toddler. Oh, it's taking so long. But for Israel, it's worse, right? They cry out, oh, the salmon, the salads, and the slavery. We had it so good. We wish we were back the way that it was. Instead, we're being led by this old prophet that God has sent us. We're sick of having the same old meal every day that God provides for us without us having to do anything and work for it. And who knows where we're going? We're told it's a good place, but we can't see that yet. We won't stop complaining until we get what we deserve. This is our human condition. And we have this myopic view of what we need right now. We're con- we conditionally complain about the here and now and the lack of something, especially if that something was once abundant. And this rabble, this uprising, is a group of people, but it's a group of people who are worried about one person me. What do I want? And what do I deserve? It's an attitude of discontent that finds its root in a heart that covets so quickly. In this case for Israel, it's their coveting of what they imagined that they left in Egypt. For us, it's uh, a coveting of a time when I didn't feel like I had the weight of the world on me and all these things that make me so tired. We covet what we once had and we no longer have. But when we do that, we're also blind to the blessing that God has for us today. It's because of our distorted memory of the past. And we devalue, then, the gifts God gives us today because of how we remember that past. For Israel, in Exodus 15, they sang about the great strength of Yahweh that delivered them away from Pharaoh's army and across the Red Sea. And God's strength 
has rescued Israel from Pharaoh, and yet they complain that their strength is dried up. God gives Israel manna, and he gives them enough for today. Instead, they covet what they no longer have. We have freedom from sin and a daily baptismal identity in Christ that can't be taken from us. And yet we complain that our earthly freedoms are taken away from us. God promises us daily bread that allows us to daily follow him. And instead, we measure our life in our lack or our abundance of things. And that negativity... That covetous negativity that starts in the one can be contagious as it grows into this group. It sure was for Moses as he was affected in leading this people by the negativity of Israel. And after this discontentment broke out within Israel, Moses cried out to God and he said, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you laid the burden of all this people on me? I'm not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you'll treat me like this, kill me at once if I find favor in your sight that I may not see my wretchedness. This is the burden that Moses feels. This is where Moses is at. And he realizes, and he complains, and he calls out to God that he can't do this alone. The burden is too heavy, and I can relate to Moses. I'm sick of so many things, too. I'm sick of the sin that I see in the world. I'm sick of the sin that I see in myself. I'm sick of the anxiety that I feel about the truth of God. And how it's going to be perceived by others when I proclaim it. I'm sick of the constant way the culture keeps trying to get me and to get you to doubt God's truth. But I'm also sick of the way that I get sucked in to coveting the past which keeps me from trusting in God to provide for today. And I get wrapped up into making this all about me. It's our constant temptation to be so sick of everything because of how it affects us personally. And sure, we are worried about others and their needs and how God's going to work and provide for them and heal them and bring them to himself. But at the end of the day, we are the ones who lie down in bed, sick and tired. So how does God draw us to see his work? What did he do for Moses? Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, And bring them to the tent of meeting. This is where Moses would meet with Yahweh and speak to him. So bring them also to that tent of meeting. Let them stand, let them take their stand there with you. God surrounded Moses with community to remind him that he wasn't alone. In following God's leading, in leading these people, God filled these men then also with his wisdom so that they could guide the rest of Israel, guide this large group of God's people to stop coveting what was lost and to look to today and look to the future with hope that was a hope sprung up because the Spirit of God was in them. And this is also how James is guiding God's church to live in that same spirit as he writes in his letter. He speaks to the church not as just individuals, but as a community. 
He speaks to them as ones who are there to build up and gather together and see God's work in one another and provide for the needs of the others around them. And he gathers them to encourage one another so that they would be a people created to support one another as they and we together follow the one who is worth following. It's not as if we're saying together, yeah, I'm sick of this too. It's just too bad. This is where we are today, so let's just deal with it. No, instead, we ask together, where is God in his grace leading us? What has he promised and already given that we can cling to, that we can delight in? As a community of faith, then we are built up by God. We're gathered in this place. We're placed in community, into families, in homes, in neighborhoods, in workplaces, in schools, as a church. We're gathered as community to find our joy in what Jesus has done for us. And we remind one another that Jesus has conquered death, and we live today in that newfound life while we face the brokenness that is within us. And in a reversal of conventional wisdom, we, we come together as a community, and we reshape our language as we listen to God's word, and we're shaped by that, and we speak not of our lack, but we take our abundance, and we see it as a gift worth sharing. And we pray for one another. We care for the body of Christ that God has placed us into. We share in conversation that builds up this body. And I know it's a radical way of thinking, but what if we stop thinking about what God is doing for me? And think about in this broader idea of community. What if God isn't using your spiritual gifts for you, but instead he has given you those gifts in order for you to be a blessing, to prepare, to proclaim, and bless the people of God around you, and to build up the next generation of his people. That's community. That's the way that God has created us to be and the way he's created us to share what we have with the next that come after us. So where are you right now? Are you living in this idea of, I'm just so sick of all of this? I know a lot of us are. This is the mindset that can let the, the grumbling and the discontentment and the coveting of the past creep in. Maybe you know someone who is struggling with anxiety and fear and doubt of what God is up to. And so I'm asking you to think about the way that James has placed us into community as he gathers us to pray for one another, to build one another up, to remind each other of those promises of God. I'm going to challenge you to grab one of these books on your way out today if you haven't grabbed one already. If you're watching online and you'd like us to send you one, we can do that too. And grab one. It's not going to fix all your problems. I can tell you that. But as you grab one, and as you read it, and as you hear God's promises once again for you, don't do that alone. But bring others alongside you so that you can be built up together in this word of God, so that you can discuss these things together, so that you can share with them those great gifts of God for you and remind them of God's promises as you are also shaped as you are also blessed by that community that is with you. And as we gather around this word of God, 
We get to see with each other again what Jesus has done, what Jesus is doing, and what Jesus will do for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand and sing in response to God's word. Please be seated. We'll worship our Lord now with our gifts, which, seeing how God has blessed us, we delight in, in returning some of what he's given to us to use to his glory. While we're doing that, we also rejoice that we're here together with each other, so we ask you, there's a black folder at the end of each pew at the center aisle. Take that, sign it, pass it along for other people to sign, so we know that you were here with us, and we can rejoice with you.
you stand? And we'll continue our prayers. Heavenly Father, keep us from craving and, and weeping and longing after what we, not, we no longer possess, but instead give us contentment in the daily bread you so graciously rain down upon us. Lord, we look at the past and things we once had, and we fail to see your gifts of this day and the gifts that you still are leading us to. Father, give us eyes to see more than our loss. Grant us eyes to see your goodness. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Father, cause your Holy Spirit to rest upon us, upon the pastors and teachers and other leaders of our church, that we may together prophesy your word, speaking it publicly and faithfully among us and in our world, that we may, that we may speak your word in our homes, that we may speak it at our places of work, our vocations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, bless our elders and the board of directors of our congregation with the necessary gifts of your spirit so that they may faithfully serve the congregation and support our pastors and teachers and staff. Uphold the ministry of the word among us, just as you surrounded Moses with 70 faithful elders. Lord, grant that, that our church may be so blessed with such lay leaders and that we ourselves also may be surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ who lift us up. Lord, in your mercy. Send forth your spirit, Heavenly Father, so that we would build one another up with your word. Strengthen the body of Christ here as we follow Jesus together. Bless us as we study your word and look to you for all good gifts. Bless this, this series of sermons and, and the time that we spend in thinking about one thing together so that we would not only learn, but that we would delight in knowing that you have first delighted in us. That we would grow in our knowledge of one another in our delight in serving you together. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, save and raise up all of those who are suffering or sick, those who remember the days of their health and strength, the days of their youth. And now, Lord, they are frustrated discouraged because of sickness or trouble. Lord, we ask you to bless Judy and Don, Rich and Nola and Jerry and Greg and, and Jeremiah who are, who are in treatment for cancer. Encourage them, Lord, with the knowledge that you have a plan for their day and their life. You have gifts for them in this day. Lord, we pray that you would, you would bless Carl and Susan in the hospital. Refresh them that they may know that, that they are, though they're away from their home and their family, that they are always with you. And their room is a place that you inhabit also. Lord, bless others who are recovering from surgery. John, uh, and after his gallbladder surgery, and, and Callum after his eye surgery, and Brian and Mike and Muriel and Marge and Steve and Branson and Pat, Joey and Lucy and Dawn and Joan and Ruth and Tom. Rebecca and Kay and Jeanette, Michael in hospice care, others who have long-term illnesses, Luella and Charlene, Bill and John and Alexandra and Sally, Jim and Mike and Ann and Leonard, Father, we pray, strengthen and uphold them that they may see not only the past or even the burdens of the present, that they may see clearly the gifts you are preparing for them. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we pray for those who grieve. We pray especially today for Rich Bergeson and for his boys, all their family. Lord, you've taken Carol to be with you in heaven. Comfort them. Fill them with your Holy Spirit and enrich them with memories of the joys of the past together as they look through family photos, but also with anticipation 
of joy together again when you will bring us all together in one place. And so we pray also for Marge and Harry Kipmiller at the passing of their twin great-grandchildren. O oh Lord, comfort their family with the assurance of the resurrection to eternal life and that the children that they held for such a short time they will hold once again forever. Bless Larry and Sandy Seltz the sudden death of, of Sandy's, of their brother-in-law, Jerry Winter. Dear Lord, comfort them, assure them that they have greater gifts still to come. Be with Deanna, Jerry's, Jerry's wife. Grant that the body of Christ may draw around her and share with her the presence of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. All these things, and whatever else you know that we need, grant to us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. James wrote, Confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. So in the way of announcements, you might have noticed we're giving away a book. If you hadn't noticed, if you weren't listening <laughs> earlier, we'll underline it again. Take one of these. And uh, the first week of the sermon series, next week, is going to basically cover five chapters. The kind of the outline of the whole concept of this delight idea in the scriptures. Um, and as we've been saying, when you're grieving and struggling and you, you feel like you're by yourself, the answer to that is not in getting the stuff that you wanted. Because we all recognize that we're not, uh, you know, we all want stuff and that people who have stuff aren't any more happy than we are, right? I was thinking during your sermon, I was thinking, when I got diagnosed with celiac disease, I'm thinking, oh, a hamburger bun toasted with sesame seeds and the, and the pizza crust, the part that bubbles around the outside. Gluten-free crust never does that. It just lays there. <laughs> oh, and yet I was no happier then when I could eat those things than I am now. God still gives me, all I have are these gluten-free Oreos to look at, which are, that's okay. God, the blessings he has for us are really in one another. The thing that he keeps calling us to, to do is to be together and to share with one another. And we, we see Christ in one another. That is a richer blessing than any of the things that we can purchase. So if you're saying, I don't know who I would talk about this book with or who I'm going to pray with, or, well, then fill out this little sheet that's with it and we'll find somebody for you. We'll connect you. I had a, um, uh, a frequent visitor of our congregation who's living in Turkey, Ankara, Turkey of all places. He says, how can I connect with somebody for this book? I said, well, we'll find some people who are good with Facebook Messenger, who will say, we'll meet together on, on our phones and be together so that the body of Christ will extend even to the Middle East. We will be there for you somehow. So don't neglect that. There's other stuff in your bulletin. I, I won't go on and on with announcements. Uh, what a rich gift. I look forward to, to uh, going through this together. Let's sing our last hymn. Go, my children, with my blessing. Number 922.